Oh, I believe something good, something of heaven is gonna take place in your life today as you open up your heart and receive from the Lord God. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word, for your incorruptible seed, Lord, that never returns empty or void, never fails, God. You watch over your word to perform it. And right now we believe we receive the precious Holy Spirit's help. In Jesus' name, amen. You need joy. This is You Need Joy Part 2, and we're going to double down on joy, the strength for life. But let's just review what we've already learned, which is amazing. So what we've learned in Part 1 is that God has an exchange program where He'll give us His joy for our sorrows. Amazing! We learned empty needs to be filled with what? God's joy. The other thing we discovered is how futile triangulating is. That's a waste of time. If you need joy, don't chase money, success, fame, and chocolate. There's nothing wrong with that stuff, but it's not joy, and it doesn't produce joy. The problem is substitution. Nothing takes the place of joy. So triangulating is just being fraudulent with your own heart. Money or success can't comfort you at the funeral for someone that you dearly, dearly love. You need God's joy, my friend. So the focus of part one, the great exchange program, laying down our sorrows at the cross for God's joy. Let's look again at Isaiah 61, verse three. To grant joy to those who mourn, to give them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, lofty, strong, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified, that God may be glorified. We exchange our sad for his glad, and that glorifies God. We get to uptrade our pain and sorrow for his joy. That glorifies God. Can you just imagine that? Exchanging your pain and uptrading to pure joy. One day, Pam surprised me with a facial. Yes, me getting a facial. We had been working hard on these big projects, and she thought that this would help relax me a little bit. It was a new place that she had heard of, and she was sure that this would just be perfect for Stephen. They brought me into a spa-like room and this precious elderly Filipino woman, she smiled at me and said that she'd be helping me out. Well, that's great, that's perfect, sounds good. So she did a little, you know, wiping and washing and I just kind of lay there trying to relax. That's what I'm told, just relax. And then she said something that got my attention. She said, okay, she said, get ready for the torture. I kind of smiled thinking surely she's, she's just kind of joking because Pam told me that this would be ultra relaxing. Oh my goodness. This lady must have been old school because she knew how to bring the pain. I had big old tears running down under my cucumber eye patches. She pinched, she squeezed, she pressed with all of her tiny little 110 pound might, all those most tender, vulnerable places on my face until I was begging Jesus. I really was praying. I was begging Jesus under my breath to deliver me from this moment. She obviously was trained by the CIA to do facials to get information. When I walked out, she said, um, my Pam said to me, she goes, what, what happened to you? I guess my face was totally swollen and distorted. It looked a mess. Afterward, I told Pam, that was awful. It was the facial from hell. I would have gladly had someone stand in for me and take my place. Please, somebody take my place. You see, is it really possible somebody could take the place of our real torture, our great pain? Could there be a real great exchange? Someone to stand in your place and bear the crushing weight of everything that breaks your heart, causes you grief, sadness, depression, and pain. I mean real life pain. My dear, dear friend, someone has. Jesus was crushed for you. He was wounded for us. Like I said in the first part, don't ever let your wounds define you. You've been hurt and broken, but Jesus is the way. Jesus is the exchange. It is an amazing heavenly concept, but it's God's way. Joy for those who mourn. A crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of sad. Nothing else can do that. No one else can do that. 
today's focus, I want to bring you to joy, the strength of life, because you need joy. And this is why it's so important. It's the strength of life. Isaiah 61, verse 4, And they shall rebuild the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former desolations and renew the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Who is going to do all that stuff? The people that just got the joy exchange. After you exchange sorrow for joy, then joy strengthens you to rebuild, to restore. After you lay down your sad for his glad, then and only then you have strength for kingdom work, but not until. We have too many empty Christians trying to do the right thing on an empty tank. That just makes for religious rituals. Giving what you don't have is just swiping your credit card, so to speak. God doesn't ask you to give what you don't have. That's a religious thing. Religion focuses on rules. Relationship focuses on the rewards. A genuine, true outcome. You are fearfully made, my friend. Your design is amazing. But amazing design requires amazing fuel. Did you know that Formula One cars can go from zero to 100 miles per hour and back to zero in four seconds? But they don't run on orange juice or Kool-Aid. You need the right high octane fuel in those cars. If love is the filling station, joy is the full. From the very first time we hear about the joy of the Lord, it's about supernatural strength. But it's about more than that. It's about being full. God calls you, but he also fills you. Look at Nehemiah 8, verse 10. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Don't sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Notice what God did not say. He didn't say, the love of the Lord is your strength. He never said that. You can't help others when you have no strength. You must be filled with his strength, his joy. Jesus said this in John 13, verse 34. He said, a new commandment I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you. You see, love is the commandment, the law of the day, but joy is the strength to walk it out. Can you just imagine with me being in a cold, icy water and with all your strength gone and you feel like you're drowning? In fact, you are drowning. You're about to go under. But then suddenly somebody who loves, loves you so very much, they jump in to save you. And that seems like a great thing, or is it? Suddenly you realize that person who loves you so very much, who jumped in to save you, there's one big problem. They don't know how to swim. They don't have the strength to swim. I, I mean, they, don't, they can't swim at all. They swim like a rock. And at that moment in life, you might say, there's nothing worse than having someone who loves you but doesn't know how to swim jump in to try to save you when you're drowning. You see, there are parents who deeply love their children, and yet their strength is depleted. It's gone. It's worn out. So then a major family crisis occurs because they can't get the love delivered or express properly. Love isn't enough, my friend, if you're powerless to deliver the goods, if you can't communicate it, if you can't get it across to the other person. I've counseled couples who say they love each other and say they love each other deeply, but just don't have the strength to go on anymore. Marriage requires strength. Family requires strength. Vision, it requires you to be full. Like our Formula One race car, amazing design, but what's it matter if there's no fuel in the tank? You're not going anywhere. So if the joy of the Lord is our strength, where do you get it? How do you source out joy, true joy? If you want a McDonald's burger, where do you get it? If you want a pair of American Eagle jeans, where do you go? If you want 90 minutes of mind-numbing, stupid entertainment... You know where to go. If you want genuine J-O-Y, the kind that makes you strong, happy, filled, where do we go? Where do you go? So let's do a quick walkthrough on obtaining this amazing J-O-Y. First, first let's deal with the what. You've got to know what you need 
You have to know what you need. Nehemiah 8 verse 10 says, the joy of the Lord is our strength. You got to know that. I've been saying from the very beginning of the series that you need joy. You got to know what you need. And then secondly, the where. Where is the real supply? Where do you get the good stuff, the real stuff, the authentic stuff? Look, there are endless copies, fakes, counterfeits. Apple juice is a liquid, but that doesn't make it race car fuel. Full of fake doesn't make you full. Full of Southern comfort doesn't make you strong or even truly comforted. David the elite warrior said this in the 23rd Psalm, good shepherd, your rod and your staff, he said, they comfort me. This was a guy who was an amazing warrior. He said, your rod and staff comfort me. He was saying, you fill me with real fuel, joy. Psalm 16 verse 11 says this, you will show me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Okay, now we know. Now we know the source for the real supply is in the presence of God. The fullness supply is in the presence of the Lord. And then thirdly, how? Let's deal with the how. How do you get there? Well, that's a big deal. Transportation issues supply chain issues. If you're starving and someone has supplied you all you need over there, well, how do you get over there? Or how do you bring over there over here? Psalm 22 verse three says, but you are holy, O you who inhabits the praises of Israel, your people. You see, this is how you get into the presence of God. Matthew 18 verse 20, Jesus said, for where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. You see, we gather in Jesus' name. Religion teaches that it's all about the physical, about the building, the premises. But Jesus teaches us that it's all about the identity of God, his name, his authority. Look at Psalm 100 verse 2. Come before his presence with singing. That's how you get there. That's how you transport into his presence. You sing to the Lord. Paul and Silas, remember those two guys? They were preaching and they got thrown into a jail. And Paul and Silas unlocked this protocol of Psalm 100 when they got thrown into prison. They knew there was great joy in God's presence because his presence carries supplies, freedom, right? So they began to sing. They began to worship and magnify the Lord. And what you magnify comes to you. And that's why freedom came to Paul and Silas, even in the prison, and got them free. That's the how. That's how you transport all of the goodness of God's presence. This is why we sing and worship. It's not religious. It's relational. It's God's protocol for coming into his presence. It's not about performance. It's spiritual protocol. David the psalmist, he sang when he was in trouble. King Jehoshaphat, they were attacked by terrorists. What did they do? They were directed by God to get the choir and sing. You got it. Jesus himself sang some hymns at the Last Supper before he went to the cross. Worship isn't just what you do. It's how you get there. It's how you get into God's presence. Even Jesus used the vision of true joy in front of him to do what he came to do here on earth. Look at Hebrews 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Who's your example? Who's your hero, your joy hero? Where are you getting your motivation from? You see, you need the right picture of faith vision. And that stirs up the joy. That stirs up your reason for going on and pushing through. My brother has young men in their 20s. But when they were little, they got bunk beds. Isaac, being the older one by a year or two, was given the top bunk. He was so excited. But they could see that little Elijah was hurt. And he began to tear up thinking that he was being deprived of the top bunk. My brother thought quickly and he said, Elijah, look at what a cool world you got. It's, it's, like, it's like a fort down here. You got a fort and you got this amazing roof over you to protect you. You're like in this fortress. You see, my brother began to cast vision for little Elijah 
and suddenly his eyes glowed and he was excited about the lower bunk. He sowed the vision of the right perspective and suddenly Elijah had great joy for what he possessed. He stirred up his joy for the gift that he had. Elijah needed vision to recognize the what, the where, and the how. Proverbs 29 verse 18 says this, without a vision, people perish. They cast off restraint, but happy and blessed is he who keeps the law of God. We have Christians living just like the world, but with even less happiness because they're living outside of their design. The same stuff that motivates the world has become the same Friday night for God's child. Should it be that way? No wonder we're depressed. If prayer is just a form we go through, but we really don't expect anything, then we really don't have God's vision for our life, do we? Prayer can't work for you if you don't know what to pray for, where it's supplied, and how to stand in faith. Ignorance of God's will is the reason too many suffer and stay stuck. The oil of joy is fuel, it's strength, it's motivation. The book of Hebrews never said, for the faith set before Jesus, he endured the cross. It never said, for the love set before Jesus, Jesus endured the cross. No. Hebrews 12 verse 2 says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. It was joy. Yes, J-O-Y that our King Savior used to strengthen and motivate himself through the worst agony, torture, and humiliation ever endured in all of eternity. Jesus uses joy. So why aren't you? Psalm 16 verse 11, in the presence of the Lord, there is joy. If you know you're not full of joy today, if you know you're empty, rejoice. Today's your day to get full, to get joyful. Don't, don't you feel condemned for a second? No. We can practice spiritual protocol right now. Come before his presence. Lay your empty down at the foot of the cross and receive the exchange of his joy. His supernatural joy filling, which is our strength, our motivation for life. It's not a religious duty. Do you need more duties? I don't think so. It's for genuine outcome, faith outcome. Isaiah 51 verse three, for the Lord will comfort Zion. Put your name in there. For the Lord will comfort you. He will comfort all her ruins and he will make her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her. Thanksgiving and the voice of a melody. God deals with your painful empty by making you full. He turns a wilderness into a beautiful garden. God's will is not for you to be stuck in some no man's land. It was a few years ago now, but Pam and I, we had got a new car. Well, at least it was new to us. Now, the thing about empty on a car gauge is that it tends to be different with various brands, right? We were driving down the highway and the gauge said empty, but in my experience with our older car, that meant we still had lots of room to go below empty. Next thing you know, we're sitting on the side of the highway calling a friend to bring us gas. Why? Was the car no good? Was it faulty? Was its design faulty? No, and again, no. It was the owner's fault. It was Stephen's fault. I was too casual with empty. I was okay with my tank being really low. Did you know that car experts say that one of the most dangerous times to ever get in a car accident or at least be rear-ended is when your tank is empty because the fumes are much more likely to explode. So a, a full tank is much safer, they say. You cannot just be free from empty, free from the shame and pain. You've got to be free from and then to be free for, free to be filled with the right fuel for life. Empty is dangerous. Free from, but free for. Life never tolerates a vacuum. If you get set free from, you must be conscious of what you're free for. Musicians know this. You can't just be free from the wrong note. You need the right note. Otherwise, the melody is broken. It's incomplete. You can't just be free from the curse and leave it there. Too many Christians stalled in condemnation, guilt, and religious works trying to add to Jesus' perfect work. It doesn't work. 
Jesus sets you free from, but Jesus at the same time sets you free for. But you've got to know that. Free from sin, but not just so that you can sin more. That's not grace. Free from sin and free for the win, joy, to walk in love, to live life strong in his will. You don't get free from one ditch to bounce across the path of life into the opposite ditch. God forbid. That's what Galatians says. The book of Galatians says that stupid thinking. Jesus sets you free from weakness for strength, his strength. The word says, taste and see that the Lord is good. He sets you free from sad for what? For glad. He sets you free from sorrow for joy. It's his strength. It's his will for your life. Gideon told the Lord in the Old Testament, he said, I'm the least of the least of the least. God was calling him to lead his army. And he said, I'm the least of the least of the least. God said this, you are a mighty man of valor. You see, God sees and knows what your true design can do on the fuel of his joy. God sets you free from your earthly carnal person for the complete opposite of who you are in the supernatural. Full of joy, you are empowered. You're a Formula One child of God. That's who you are. So what is truly believing? How do we really do this? How do we apply it? Well, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 8 and 9 says this, Though now you do not see him yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Look at that, joy inexpressible and full of glory. Verse 9, receiving the end of your faith, the outcome of your faith. Rejoicing with joy is a powerful force because it contains God's glory, his empowerment. God's glory represents the essence of his character, his name, his goodness. This is why we rejoice, to magnify God's name and his character, to be in his presence. What you celebrate, it comes to you. What you recognize comes toward you. Philippians 4 verse 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, rejoice. Then, oh my dear friend, then you receive the outcome of your faith. Joy is the strength that brings up God's glory, God's name, God's goodness, the God outcome. So how do we rejoice then? We, we say what he says. We exercise our faith by singing to the Lord. We reject what we're free from and we accept what we're free for. We reject sin, we receive grace. My friend, what you tolerate, you can never change. You can never ever change. So don't tolerate sad, but reach for glad. And then we sing, we sing for joy. Look at Psalm 100 verses one through three. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with what? Gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. I told you, you are his Formula One race car. Can you just hear the joy in every directive of that psalm? It's not a, well, make, make a mournful noise to the Lord. That, that just, that would be sound so religious. Psalm 30, verse 4 and 5, sing to the Lord, O you his godly ones, and give thanks at the mention of his holy name. Verse 5, his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping, it may endure for a night, but a shout of joy comes in the morning. My friends, sing. We may cry for a season, we may cry through the night, but joy comes in the morning. God's favor is for a lifetime. And you know what that spells, right? J-O-Y, joy. You obtain when you remain in his presence. Let me say that again. You obtain when you remain in his presence. So we sing. That's why we sing and praise the Lord. We rejoice. We make some noise. We make some noise, amen? Here's where you wanna start, by inviting the true source of joy, all that joy and peace into your heart. It's Jesus. God is the God of all hope, and he fills us with joy and peace as we believe on him. So come to Jesus. Pray this after me. Dear Lord Jesus, Without you, I'm empty. I need you to save me. I need you to fill me. You died on the cross 
And after three days and nights in the grave, God raised you up alive. You are the Holy Son of God. Forgive me of all my sins. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Be my Lord and Savior. Flood my heart now with your joy and peace. All in your name, Jesus. Amen. Thank you for sharing this very important time with us. We pray and believe that God's Word is guiding your life and your future from this moment on. Thank you for your generous support. Together, we're getting God's good news to others. Sign up today for the free Today's Life Talk, an encouraging gift from Pastor Stephen. He sends directly to your email. At Living Room Church, you are loved, and we pray blessings on you. Remember, Jesus is Lord, and in Him, we can live life strong.